Hallelujah and good morning, everyone. And thank you, Sharon Choir, for a very eloquent and moving anthem. Um, as our elder has shared, our pastor Samuel Kim is away for just this short one week because he's working really hard to preach a series of nine lectures for the very first time in Italy to pastors who are flying all over in from Europe just to hear the word of redemptive history. I believe that all of these Zion members and those of you who are online are greatly blessed because you kept your position this Lord's Day to really hear the word of God. And I believe God has great blessings for you the whole week stored up just through today. Now, today, um, we're going to go through the biblical series. This series that we have been going on with Pastor is called the Biblical Values, Values from the Bible. So this last installment that we're going through is on reconciliation. So earlier in the last few weeks, just to remind us, we have gone through biblical values of between parents and children. We have studied about money. We studied about the law of God, right, last week. So today we're going to go through this very easy to understand but extremely hard to do uh, topic called reconciliation. So Without further ado, we'll begin. This is going to be based on book two of the History of Redemption series, written by Reverend Abraham Park, and it's the story on Jacob. Now, as we look at this, we'll be looking at it from two perspectives. We'll be looking at Jacob's reconciliation with someone who oppressed him, and that is Laban, his uncle. We will also be looking at the reconciliation of Jacob with someone that he wronged, someone who hates him, and that is his twin older brother, Esau. So the definition of an enemy, if we look up the Cambridge Dictionary, is someone who hates you, someone who opposes you, someone who means harm to you or stops you from something you wish to do. And we all have met this sort of people in our lives. How young you might be or how mature we may be, There are always people with whom you have conflicts in our families, in our workplaces, government, anywhere, right? Even against our neighbors sometimes. So as we look at the first person that Jacob reconciled with, it is with Laban. So who is Laban? Laban is Jacob's father-in-law. He is also Jacob's boss. He is Jacob's oppressor. And he's Jacob's uncle. Jacob had to live with this Laban for close to 20 years. 20 years, right? He couldn't run away. So as we look at this first person, I would like you to think as we reflect on this story about what you might be going through and the burdens you might be carrying in your own heart, suffering from someone like this. Not necessarily your father-in-law, but someone or something that causes you great pain and burden and suffering. So, for Jacob, the lesson today here is, how could he forgive Laban? When we use this word reconcile, we're talking about forgiveness, letting go that burden in your heart, right? So, let's take a look at this section. We know that Jacob had two wives, the one he loved, the beautiful Rachel, for whom he served seven years. And so terribly, on his wedding day and his wedding night, his father-in-law swapped the bride for the ugly older sister. It doesn't matter if she's ugly or not. It's not the one he loved, right? So for seven years, he had worked to marry Rachel. Now the father-in-law says, okay, you can. I'll add on. But you add another seven years. So by now, Jacob had worked 14 years for free. He was a free servant just to marry these two wives. Right? Now he wants to go home. And when he wanted to go home, you can see how poor and how little money he really had. Bible tells us in Genesis 30 verse 25, as you can see on the screen, what does he say? He said, send me away. He said to Laban, send me away that I may go home and give me my wives and my children, only his wives and his children. Nothing else. He didn't ask for any money. He had none, right? And This is after 14 years of labor and suffering, he wanted to go home. Now, if you are a boss or a company with a star salesperson, right? A star employee who made you tons and millions of dollars, what would you do when you receive notice? You would 
counter offer, wouldn't you? You would counter offer. So now, of course, Laban counter offered and said, "Name your wage. What do you want? I will pay you." And although it was not a good boss, right? It's just not a good environment to work for. Jacob said, "Okay, I will work six more years for you." And this is what he said. He said, "Just let me pick any goat or any lamb that is speckled, spotted." Okay, speckled, spotted, and striped, or black in color. If the lambs were black, he would take it, or spotted or speckled. Why? In the Palestinian region, all sheep, the dominant gene is to produce white wool, white fur, right? And for goats, it is always black. So, in order to see a spotted, a striped, or a speckled, tiny little spots, right? That would be a recessive gene. It's very rare. It's just like. In、amongst us, to see an albino, it's very rare, right? So for Jacob to say, oh, "Oops, all the good, all the good animals you keep, I would just take the ones which are imperfect," is a bad deal for him. But he did so in order to honestly pick which ones belong to him. I might have disconnected the mic. So let's see what he said. He said, "So my honesty will answer for me later. These are my wages." What does this mean? This means he believes that God will be the one who will give him his wages, right? Sorry. Do I tap it again? Okay. Testing. I will speak into one mic. So, after he said this, Laban agreed. Laban said, "Yes, I will do it." But this is the dishonest Laban's behavior. Imagine that this is your boss. He said, "Okay," and then that very day of the contract, he got his sons to remove all the spotted, speckled, and striped goats and sheep out of the flock and separated it by a three-day journey. So it's impossible for pure white sheep and pure black goats to mate and produce spotted, speckled, and striped offspring. Right? Impossible. This is how dishonest Laban was. Now, Jacob was not let down by his God, and this is instructive for us. Where you may feel you're working harder than your salary is paid to you, right? He said, "My honesty will answer for me." Now, in Hebrew, honesty is sadaka, which means righteousness and justice. These two terms are used to describe God, right? And answer for me is to testify, like in court of law, you have a witness. That will testify you did so. So what Jacob is saying is, God will pay me. God will pay me, not you, my boss Laban. God will pay me from whatever it is that is born from these sheep and goats. Right? This is instructive for us. You may have different bosses. You may have different ways of income. Whether you think it fair for the labor you have put in or not, God will pay you for your wages in time. There is a timing for this. So, what did Laban do? We know first fourteen years no salary, right? He only received these spotted sheep in the last six years. But in the last six years, Laban actually changed the contract ten times. So, because he said, "I agreed to give you spotted, speckled, and striped sheep and goats," then he removed it. But God produced so much babies from pure white and pure black that everything that came out was spotted, speckled, and striped. So Laban said, "This is not a good deal. So I'll change it. Now I only will give you spotted." Then guess what? The moment he changed the contract, all the young lambs and goats were spotted. And then Laban said, "No, all striped." So all the babies that came out from these goats and lambs became striped. So let's see. If he said he is Laban, the spotted shall be your wages. Then all the flock bore spotted. And if Laban said the stripe shall be your wages, then all the flock bore striped. This is scientifically impossible. Impossible that once the contract changes, genetics of the sheep and goats change instantly. Absolutely not possible. So if you can see, originally coloured now became spotted and speckled. Now only striped. But God. Did this miracle to pay back Joseph in his last six years? So the word used is Jacob said God has taken away 
the livestock of your father. Whose father? He's talking to his two wives, right? Rachel and Leah. Your father tricked me, but God gave it back to me. This word taken, in the original Hebrew word, it's natsal, and it means to recover, restore, by snatching it away. So God took it, even though Laban had engineered to keep it from him. So let's see what is the ending. He said, 20 years I've been in your house. Finally, right, when Jacob spoke to Laban, he said, and you changed my wages 10 times for these six years, right? But God delivers you as he delivered Jacob. This is what the Bible says, the righteousness of the upright will deliver them. So there will come a time, and it will certainly come, where your honesty and your hard work in whatever work that you're doing will be repaid to you. Why so? Why so to Christians? So you can do the work of expanding God's kingdom. Isn't that your goal when you pray for God to prosper you? So you can do more of God's work. You won't be enslaved to your job 24-7, right? So now, how did this happen? There are two methods that Jacob used. This is just for trivia, but important trivia, just to show you how unscientific it was. What he did was he took some branches, which are green, and he peeled off the bark in strips. So it would be green and white, where it's peeled off is white, right, showing the inside. Green, white, green, white, green, white. Then he laid it on the watering bowls, so when the sheep and goats came to drink water and mate, they would look at these striped bark, and automatically the babies would come out striped. This has never happened therefore afterwards. So no one who's a sheep farmer does this, because genes are not modified by what you see, right? The second thing that he did, and we need to see, this is purely by, 100% by the grace of God. It's illogical. What he did was he made all these sheep that were going to mate face now the new babies that were born, which are striped, spotted, and speckled, right? And so the babies that are born continued to be spotted, speckled, and striped. And this is exactly the two things that was done. It is absolutely by God's intervention. There is no logic to this prosperity. What is the result after this happened? He became very rich, very, very rich, right? The Bible states that the man, this is Jacob the man, increased greatly and had large flocks, female servants, male servants, why? To look after the flock, right? Camels and donkeys to carry the shepherds, right? So this, thus, you see, God has taken away Natsau and restored to Jacob for all the first 14 years of free labor and the last six years of unfair contract. So whatever is your contract, you don't have to worry if you have no power to renegotiate. You don't have to worry if you're being taken advantage of by your customer, your shareholder, government regulations for lockdown, right? None of that matters. Your competitors, right? Everything is still in God's hands. At the right time, your honesty will answer for you, right? So please believe this. Now, your question to us is, yes, we understand God will, but when? We don't know when. Jacob didn't know when, right? But Jacob remembered God's word. So how did he survive 20 years of suffering unfair treatment? He did it so by remembering what God promised him at Bethel. Just as you and I, we remember the word that is preached to us every sermon, every Bible study, right? It says here, behold, I am with you. This is what God said. I am with you and will keep you. I will guard you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land where? Canaan. For I will never leave you. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. So, dear brothers and sisters, God will be fully responsible for you till you reach home to our spiritual Canaan. This is his promise to Jacob to illustrate how much security you have backing you, right? This is the promise to us. So now, how does this happen in our daily lives? We're not shepherds, right? You're not breeding sheep. The Bible tells us money will be made by all sorts of people in this world, but God will let all those which are huge amounts of money made by the non-believers, in the right time, he will give it to you, the believer. 
Ecclesiastes chapter two verse twenty six says, "For to the one who pleases Him, you, you who come to church on Lord's Day and receive God's word, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, He has given what business? Gathering and collecting, only to give to you, the one who pleases God, right?" So, given Laban's constant deception, it's impossible, impossible, for Jacob to actually renegotiate the contract. Right? Basically, Laban had blackmailed Jacob by holding his wives with him. He could not leave. Right? So, what then happened? Finally, after six years are done, he goes home, but he didn't dare go home openly. Why? Because Laban would have prohibited him. So how did he leave? Once a year, you see, we may cut our hair once every two, three months, but sheep gets shorn once a year. All that wool is harvested by the, you know, shepherd once a year. Very heavy, right? So that's like a celebration. You get all your money once a year from that wool. During shearing day, always the master would throw a big party, a feast for his servants, his family, especially for the poor and sojourners in the land. This is what he would do. But Jacob was so lowly treated and so looked down upon. He was never invited, ever. So he was not expected to turn up, and Laban didn't look for him. During this three-day party, first day that started, Jacob fled with his wives. So it was only three days later that Laban found out that Jacob left. Right. So it says here. Why he left? There were two reasons. First, Jacob saw that Laban and his sons started to dislike him. Back when he worked the first fourteen years for free, they liked him, free labor, right? But when he started to become rich off the commission of getting the spotted, striped, and speckled sheep and goats, he's not popular anymore. They felt that this money should be ours. You should be giving to us for free. So, secondly, God at this time says, "Go home. Time to go home to Canaan." Right, the time has come. There will come a time for you as well. That time may not be the time we think our patience can hold up to, but that time will come. And so, when God says return to the land, Laban's heart was hardened the same way Pharaoh's heart was hardened towards the Israelites. Right. So, let's take a look at this map now. From here, this is Padam Aram. This is the area. Where Jacob lived with Laban and married his wives, and then this is the area that he grew up, Bia Laharoi. For him to come from Padam Aram down all the way, this journey is altogether 580 kilometers. It's not a short distance; it's a very long distance. So he had to secretly rush. Right, without his father-in-law knowing, with eleven children, just try to get two children out of the house. It is close to impossible to do it on time. Eleven children, four wives, sorry, eleven sons, one daughter, because Benjamin is not yet born. Right, so eleven sons, one daughter, hordes of shepherds and servants. He has to escape down here. Right, so three days lead time. What then happened? Laban chased. Just like Pharaoh chased angrily, right after the free labor that the Israelites gave, so the Bible tells us that Laban was only notified on the third great, third day that Jacob had fled, but he pursued him and followed close. In seven days' time, this journey took ten days for Jacob, but Laban took seven days to run the same journey and catch up. Where at this place that we call Gilead? Let's zoom in on this place, shall we? At this place, Laban caught up with him. This is the end for Jacob. You have an angry man, just like Pharaoh coming after the Israelites, right? He would have killed him. He never respected this son-in-law. What had happened was God appeared to Laban at night in the dream to sternly warn Laban: Don't do anything. Do not do anything. Don't say anything good. Don't say anything bad. This is what God said. It is. This is what Laban said. It is in my power to do you harm. It means he intended harm. But the God of your father, he said, your God spoke to me last night, saying, "Be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad." This is a Hebrew idiom, which means don't say anything, whether you agree or disagree. Do not scold. Do not attack. 
Just accept whatever Jacob says to you. If God appears to Laban and says such a thing, Laban was certainly taken aback, right? So at this stage, we can see what did Laban do? Laban didn't scold him, but he said, you stole my gods. You stole my teraphim. Not knowing that it was his own daughter, Rachel, that took it, right? So after searching the tents, he found nothing. So how? At this time, Jacob let all his pent-up anger go and he said, the reason why I didn't tell you I'm leaving is because I knew you would forcibly snatch my wives away. Which, which son-in-law here would think that your father-in-law would snatch your wife away after 14 years of marriage? None, right? But Laban did not deny it. Laban didn't say, no, 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 I would not. Laban said, okay, that's true, he would have, right? So this is what it says, right? How you can see what a bully and how oppressive and uncivilized gangster Laban really was, okay? So what did Laban do next? Now he knows he cannot attack Jacob. He cannot do anything but accept what Jacob says. Jacob wants to go home. So this is how God is so amazing. He loves Jacob as he loves you. Laban volunteers to say, let's make peace. He now changes warmly and tells Jacob, let's make a covenant of peace, okay? We make a promise, you will never marry, marry any other women other than my daughters, and we promise that at this spot, we will never ever cross over to attack one another. He's trying to protect his own things, right? So this is what Jacob did. What would you do if you are now in a position to attack? Jacob swallowed, he forgave all the things that Laban had done to him, right? And said, okay, I will make this covenant of peace. I will make peace with you. How can you do this? How can you make peace with someone who tortured you for 20 years? You could only do so if you found a bigger comfort from God than everything you have lost in the last 20 years, right? And this is how God loves you. He loves you to the end Often it's us who give up. So if you don't give up, God will give you. Your honesty will answer for you at the right time. So let's see what happens. They had a meal. They actually fell asleep at the same place. And next morning, Laban woke up and blessed everyone, right? He didn't bless Jacob. Note what he said. In the morning, Laban arose, kissed his grandchildren and his daughters and blessed them. He blessed his own blood, right? He didn't bless Jacob, but we don't need his blessing, right? Jacob had God's blessing. So then Laban went home. This is instructive for how to forgive. We can forgive the way that Jacob could forgive if God has given us much more than what we have lost. So keep this in your mind as you think about a face, hopefully not, or faces of people in your community, in your family, in your workplace, that has offended you, you can't let go, right? That person can be forgiven by you because you have received far more and you will receive far more from God. Now, let's look at the second person now. The second obstacle to reconciliation is much more difficult. This is Esau. We know the story of Esau, right? Esau is the twin brother, twin, twin brother, right? Not just a brother from the same womb. They're psychologically linked of Jacob. And his father and mother, both of their father and mother, which is Isaac and Rebekah, could not give birth for 20 years. So they prayed and God finally gave two boop, boop, at the same time. While in the womb of Rebekah, she felt the two babies were struggling, kicking each other, not kicking the mother, kicking each other, right? So she wondered and prayed and God told Rebekah, two nations, not two children, two nations will come forth. The younger, will be the stronger. The older will serve the younger. So she kept it in mind. These two will be the father of Israel, Jacob, and the father of Edom, Esau, right? Now, how did they grow up? They grew up in the most different of ways, right? Esau was the alpha male in today's terms. He was always outgoing. He was probably muscular and tanned, and you know he's hairy, right? He smells like the field, right? Jacob was the nerd likes to stay at home, he likes to listen to his grandfather Abraham tell stories, he listens to his mom, he knew how to cook very well, right? Great, great skill. And he also loved the faith 
that his grandfather, his father Isaac, had taught him about, right? And he really wanted it. Jacob was a wily fox, a young little wily fox. He knew exactly what he needed to do and he bided his time well, right? So we need to catch on to the correct thing here. The correct thing is we have to be this spiritual nerd, the same way Jacob was. It doesn't matter what order you're born in your family or what order you came to this church. It doesn't matter. What matters is, do you have that desperate heart to seek after God's word the way Jacob did? And if you do, that blessing of the firstborn is given to you. You don't have to claw for it. You don't have to grasp it. God gives this word freely, right, to those who receive and desire it. So now, as we look at this, Jacob did two things wrong to his brother. First, he tricked the brother. When the brother was really hungry, what would a loving Christian do? You would give that red bean stew free of charge, right? Come, brother, eat as much as you want. But a cunning brother would say, you want red bean stew? Sure. Sell me your blessing. Because you know how hungry your brother is, right? So he tricked the brother. This is the first thing. Second thing he did wrong is he tricked his father. Father's eyes were dim. He dressed up as his elder brother, pretended to be his elder brother, and tricked his father to bless him the firstborn blessing. Right? So Esau now hates Jacob, hates his guts. And he said this, the days of mourning of my father are approaching. This is Esau hating Jacob. And then I will kill my brother Jacob. Why? Why does he have to wait for his father Isaac to die? Because if not, Isaac might curse him, right? The blessing he received is more like a curse. So if Isaac had cursed him, it would be worse off than before. Then Israelites are very serious about their blessings. So he was biding his time to kill Jacob. When Jacob escaped, Esau was the same age, 76 years old. These are two old men hating each other, just to put it in context, right? So what is the lesson and what did Jacob do that we can learn from? It is to learn one of the most difficult things in life, to be forgiven by somebody else. Which do you think is easier, for you to forgive or for you to be forgiven. It is always yourself that you think you have control over, right? To be forgiven by your enemy is the most difficult thing. This reconciliation, we're going to learn how Jacob did this, how God enabled Jacob's struggle in his heart to be forgiven. So if there are people whom you need to forgive you today for things we have done in the past, this is extremely interesting and instructive. So let's see what happens. We know Jacob had the covenant of peace, right, with his father-in-law. Now he goes on. When I say 20 years later, it means 96 years old. Now Esau and Jacob was 96 years old, two even older men. What God did was he knew Jacob was so scared to return home. So he sends two battalions, two camps of angels. These are not two angels, there are 2,000 or 20,000 angels, to the point that Jacob would look at these angels appearing as if welcoming a general home from war to call them Mahanaim, which is two camps of angels, right? Mahana means one camp of angel. Mahanaim is two camps, right? God has angels to protect you, which you cannot see. For those who are believers and are doing his will, these are invisible angels which are surrounding you that we may not see. And God allowed Jacob to see, right, when he had to do this difficult thing to obey God's word. So what happened? Jacob now had a little bit of courage, a little bit of courage that, yeah, maybe I will not die. So what does he do? He does four things. We're going to go through these four things and we're going to learn lessons from it. First thing he did, he sent a messenger, right, to try to inform his brother, like sending an email, I'm coming home, right? And guess what happened? Messengers brought back really lousy news, which is your brother is bringing an army of 400 men, not 400 flocks or shepherds or children, men. Remember, what kind of a person was Esau? Strong, alpha male, hairy, likes the field. And his father had blessed him you will live by the sword. Exactly like this prophecy, he built up a militia over 20 years, right? 
four hundred men is much more than. Remember, Abraham had three hundred and eighteen trained servants that he could use to defeat four kings inside Canaan to rescue Lot. So four hundred is, of course, four hundred is much more than this three hundred and eighteen of Abraham, right, the grandfather. So he brought four hundred to kill his brother and ensure no escape. There is no doubt about it. So Jacob became became greatly afraid and distressed. So what did he do? Let's take a look. First thing, human method. He thought, let me divide my people and my flocks into two batches. In case one is attacked, I have 50% chance of retaining and survival, right? Money and life. This is what he did. Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. He divided the people thinking two camps into two camps thinking, if Esau comes to the one camp and attacks it, then the camp that is left will escape, right? This is the human method. After doing this, he was still afraid. So he prayed. We do this too, right? We're in trouble. Quickly fix it first. Okay, then we pray because I'm still a bit worried and nervous, right? So when he prayed, he prayed to God this way. He took God's promise and said, save me, because you promised me, God, right, that you will make a descendant out of so many for my grandfather and for me, right? So if I die at the hand of my twin brother, how could this happen? He said, please deliver me from the hand of my brother Esau, for I fear him. Because you said, right, God, you said, I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered. So he's saying, if I die now, God, what you said, poof, gone. When we pray to God, we need to do this too. Hey, God, you promised me, right, the blessing of the firstborn. So that means I must survive. So God, deliver me. This word deliver, strangely, coincidentally, is the same word natsal, which God used to snatch and recover from Laban's livestock to give to Jacob. Now Jacob is saying, you snatch me, away from my brother because my brother wants to grasp me and kill me, right? So he clung on to God. Next, what's the third thing that he did? First, he divided into two. Second of all, he prayed. Third, he gave a gift, right? It says, so he stayed there that night and from what he had with him, he means Jacob. He took a present for his brother Esau. Now, he prayed for a long time and he thought, what must I do? I must pass my brother to get to Canaan. If I don't, I cannot return to Canaan. I can't do God's will. I can't go to Bethel. Bethel is inside Canaan, right? So it's the same for you. If we look at this in our lives today, God says you go to heaven. You will go to heaven, right? But you cannot see the face of the second coming if we are not at peace with any human being on this earth. Now that's tough. To believe in Jesus is easier than to make peace with all enemies, right? So this is the the thing now. He gave a present. Now, he tried his best. It says from what he had with him. What he had with him in the original Hebrew word means what came into his hand. Whatever God has given you in this life, it came from God. It's not from your own cleverness to earn it or inherit it, right? God gave it to you. He used that and he gave a present to his brother. You know how many animals? 550. There is a wisdom in how he gave this present, which I thought was very interesting. And I'd like to share to you how Reverend Abraham Park describes this. It was so interesting, right? First, he divided all these 550 animals into five different groups with a space in between. So he gave one batch and he gave space and the second batch. It is like this, if I want to give you a hamper, you're my enemy, you're not, but if I wanted to give you five hampers, I could give it to you on Sunday, boom, now. Or I could give you now, Sunday one, Monday another, Tuesday another, Wednesday another, Thursday another. It would create an illusion that, wow, this gift is so big, right? I'm waiting, what's next? It's anticipation. Second thing that he did, was he made the shepherds move behind the animals. That is illogical. Shepherds always move ahead of the sheep, right, to guide the goats and sheep where to go. To move the shepherds behind is to give another illusion that I have so much more behind. I don't mind if I have some animals lost in front. So Esau was receiving the gift like this, drove after drove. Third, very orderly, species by species, lambs, 
goats, camels, oxen. It was not mixed together like rujak, no, right? It was separated. And then next, the fourth thing, the way he addressed his brother is, he told his servants to call Esau, my king, my lord, and to call himself your servant. Let's read this. Genesis 32 verse 18. You shall say, he's telling his servants, they belong to your servant, Jacob. They are a present sent to my lord Esau. Right? Can we just throw back 20 years ago? Those of you who have children who are having more than one child, have you ever seen any of your children calling each other my king? They are more likely pulling each other's hair out, right, and smacking each other than, my lord, I'm your servant. There's no game that I know of that children call each other like that. Even when they grow up, no sibling normally calls your other sibling, my king, right? 20 years ago, Jacob could never imagine, never calling his brother, my lord. It's like pay, no way, right? But 20 years later, after all the hardship he suffered under his uncle, he can call his brother, my Lord. We call this the humbling of Jacob. God intends for Jacob to be the firstborn. But before he could be used and blessed, he has to be cut down into pieces and humble. This is identical to God's character when Jesus said, right, to his disciples, you want to be the greatest, then you have to be a servant of all. So this spirit is not inculcated to us by birth. You learn this and I learn this through hardship and suffering when we are forced to kowtow to people. Customers, suppliers, people around, government policies, people, right? People who basically crush you down in situations that you cannot escape from. So this is the humbling of Jacob. And Jesus says, whoever wished to be great must first be your servant, right? So next thing that Jacob did after the present, after prayer, is he still afraid? So comes the special wrestling with God at Jabok. We know this story. An angel came, and this is God in the form of a man wrestling with a 96-year-old frail man. He was left alone, and when he was alone, this Jacob, who had planned so intricately all these droves of presents, how to give the shepherd, where to walk, what to say, now he's faced with the fact that he can still die even after all these things that he did. So when he prayed, this is what God did. God answered him. But what kind of a prayer do you and I have to pray in order to be answered? Genesis, earlier in this verse, doesn't tell us when he wrestled how he was praying, right? But Reverend Abraham Park took up Hosea chapter 12, verse 4, and he revealed that as Jacob was wrestling with this angel, he wept and sought the angel's favor. This word wept means to lament, oh, with a loud cry in tears, right? Not, please, 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 not like that. So he cried out in this way, in tears, wishing for God to help him. We need to have this kind of a heart-squeezing prayer if you are in that kind of a situation or if you desire to be forgiven, right? Second thing he sought, this word sought in the original Hebrew text is Hanan, which is same word used when Joseph begged his brothers, please don't throw me into this pit and let me die. This is how he loudly wept and prayed. So the answer to this is that God smacked him on his hip and dislocated his hip bone. You might think this is a, not a big deal. It's a big deal. For 96-year-old men, to dislocate any part of your body is life-threatening. But the hip is connected to the longest human bone in your body. We call this the thigh bone. Jacob's hip was pulled out of joint. To let you see a little bit of biology, the femur is this thigh bone. The joint of his femur, which connects to his pelvic bones, were dislocated. We have an elder who also had a similar problem in the past. It was excruciating from his testimony. But our elder is young and fit. Jacob is 96 years old and frail. Remember he was a nerd? He wasn't the alpha male, right? Not the school athlete. So he caused, God caused the longest bone in Jacob's body to be dislocated. Why? 
This is a process that we have to go through. This long bone is the strongest bone for Jacob. It represents to Jacob his greatest strength. You and I are given to different talents. Some are very sociable, some are very musical, some are very athletic. Some of you have the super brains that can remember photographically. Some are fantastic with earning money. Some are wonderful with people, right? You guys all have different talents that you pride yourself for or developed over these years. Jacob prided himself of being a very shrewd man, and he is very shrewd. But as he prayed, he let go of that. He realized that's nothing. It's really nothing. Just as Apostle Paul prided himself initially on the Roman citizenship, great education under Gamaliel, right? It's nothing. It's counted as rubbish. Only thing Jacob realized he needed is God's favor. When we pray, we're not just praying for an end result. We're praying that we can let go and only have God fight this battle. If it's only you fighting the battle, you will always feel nervous because we are not invincible, right? So God dislocated Jacob's strength, leaving Jacob like this. Only after this, God asked the most strange question. He asked Jacob, what's your name? Of course God knew. Of course God knew Adam's name. Of course God knew where Adam was, right? But he asked Jacob to force Jacob to say, I am Jacob which means I am that supplanter, I am that deceiver, I am that liar. I lied to my father, I lied to my brother. He is forcing Jacob to confess. It must have been very, very humiliating for Jacob to do so. But when he did so, God says, no, you are not. I forgive you, you are Israel, for you will win. Right? You are Israel. You, my fellow brothers and sisters, are the spiritual Israel. To become Israel, we have to wrestle with ourselves in prayer with God. Not kneel until your hip is dislocated, but kneel until your pride and my ego is dislocated. Okay? So what did he do now? Everything's dislocated. So he met his brother. This is what he did. He ran. No, I'm sorry. He couldn't run. He walked and he bowed down to the ground seven times. I couldn't find an old man bowing down but this would be how he would do it. Can you imagine dislocated hip, kneeling, bowing. Your fulcrum is your pelvis. How could you bow without pain? He must be grimacing with every bow, seven times, perfectly submitting to his brother. What is the result? This is the best reconciliation you can hope for. And when you read the opening verse for today, you read, right? Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell and, on his neck and kissed him and they wept. These five verbs in yellow, ran, embraced, fell, kissed, is third person masculine singular. Put it in simple English, one man did it. Which man? Esau. Esau ran. Esau was moved. He hugged his brother. Esau hugged his neck and Esau kissed him, right? And this last word, wept, cried, is Third person masculine, plural, two men, who? Jacob and Esau cried. At that moment, Esau was so sorry that he wanted to kill his brother. And Jacob was so happy he wasn't killed. And his brother could forgive him, right? This is the power of your prayer. If you really empty out yourself, God resolves all problems. All these enemies will go away, right? Now, then Jacob says this. I want you to think now. It was I was preparing this. I was like, wow, so tough. Think of someone you really hate, right? Or really dislike. Really dislike. And try to say what Jacob said. For I have seen your face. And it is like seeing the face of God. I've seen your face. And it's like seeing the face of God. For him to say this to Esau, he's saying, Esau, you're like God to me. For us, if you think of someone you dislike, you probably might want to just vomit to even say, right? To see your face, face of God, face of demon more like. But this is what exactly what God wanted us to learn. He wrote this down. Now, do you think this is a show? No, they parted ways. 24 long years later, they reunited for the funeral of their father. And the Bible gives this heartwarming scene that Esau and Jacob buried Isaac. How wonderful is this, right? So what's the conclusion for today? 
we learn about reconciliation, of how we forgive others, and how others can come to forgive us. But the key is always if we first seek to reconcile with God, what is separating us from God is really our ego. It's what I don't want to give up, right? When that is dislocated from me, then God can reconcile you with all the most difficult characters in your life. You have things to ask from from your boss, from people like your neighbors, from your family. They do not always agree with you. You might dislike their characters. They may not be good people. It doesn't matter, right? What matters is the peace that you must have in order to meet with your God. So Job tells us, right, agree with God and be at peace. Good will come to you. When a man's ways, Proverbs 16, 7, please the Lord, he makes even his enemies be at peace with him. So the best role model is our Jesus. He came before we asked to reconcile us with Father God, right? So we can do the same because you are so loved by God, so well provided for, so comforted. What do we need to hold on to of our own to be able to ask God for help? Right? So reconciliation is not just a biblical value. It's a constant way of life that God introduces these frictions to our lives so that we can dislocate more of myself, my spiritual hip bone. Right? And to the point that Jesus says, if you have a grudge in your heart, before you come to church to give your offering, reconcile first. Otherwise, our offering is not taken. Right? So this is how important reconciliation is for us. So in closing, let's read Hebrews 12, 14. Strive for peace with everyone, not people we like, everyone. For the holiness, for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. We need to depart from evil and do good, seek peace and chase after it. Our church motto for this year, I will read it, is the precept, a church that is selflessly devoted to making great advances, great advances in proclaiming the word of redemptive history. How can we do great things if our hearts are so narrow? We need to develop the largest size of heart, right, to do great things. So Zion Church, you are a great church because you have this great word. Our hearts need to be a great heart so that we can absorb all types of people's nations, right, into the auspices of our Father. So I pray and I believe that this will be done. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for your timely and stern reminder to us that we are falling short so, Father, for your precious church whom you love, let us spiritually come close to you through your word every time. And through the many difficulties and faces of challenges that we face in our life, people whom we cannot forgive, who do not forgive us, help us to pursue peace and reconcile. Father, as you melt our hearts with your word, help us to, through melting your heart, have no more conflicts with anyone. Father God, we long to see your face, but we cannot. So Father, through the word today, let us change and confess we are all Jacobs. We are all Jacobs. So may we receive the same blessing of this firstborn, for you love us, and recompense Zion Church members for their honest hard work that they have put in for their various stations in life, that they can do great work and great advances for you this year. Father, we believe you have answered this prayer. In Jesus' most precious name, we pray with full thanksgiving. Amen. Amen.